conventional soldier. A military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Thank you for downloading another episode from the Unconventional Soldier podcast, which aims to record the history of the British Army's STA patrols unit through the voices of the veterans who served in its ranks. Today we're talking to John Holden, who is a troop commander and then battery commander on Optelic in Iraq. And we'll be talking about that deployment and the role of STA patrols on this enduring coalition operation against the so-called global war on terror. Telic 2 was immediately after the war phase, and it was believed that this would have made mass th marked the start of a more supportive, stabilising and rebuilding period, but it is actually the start of a violent and bloody insurgency. And in some ways, Iraq has become overshadowed by Operic in Afghanistan, but there was some tough fighting over this period that equaled and in some cases surpassed the violence in Afghan. And as normal, we'll finish off with Desert Island Debts, which is John's choice of book, film and luxury item. So, John, thanks for coming on the podcast, and we'll commence with your military backstory leading up to the Telic deployment. Um, well, first of all, it, it's great to be here and talking to uh, you two again. Um, without um, complimenting you too much, you were both very much part of my 473 battery career. Um, so my military career started off in September 91. I'd, I'd been in the officer training corps when I was at university, but I went to Sandhurst in September 91 and joined my first unit in October 92. Graduates in those days only actually served six months at Sandhurst. Uh, my unit was 10 SA Air Defence Battery, which in those early days was part of 40 Regiment Royal Artillery, uh, but that moved in December of 1992 to join up with 47 Regiment Royal Artillery as an Air Defence, Close Air Defence Regiment. Uh, I stress that part because it was my time in 10 Battery that really exposed me to 473 Battery, as we were all part of the Dramad Rulemont Battalion tour to Northern Ireland in 94-95, because our battery was attached to 5 Regiment for that tour. Uh, and this coupled with one of my instructors at Sandhurst being from 473, you put those together and my appetite was wet. Um, my time in 10 Battery ended in, uh, after the completion of that tour in April 95, and I was looking for my next job. Uh, my first choice was Ford ob Observation Officer, uh, and my preference was 2-9 Commando, uh, but there were no vacancies, so I, I asked for 473. Um, I joined in the summer of 95 and went straight on to the Winters course that year. Um, and again, I, I, I think I'm... I think I'm correct, but you will correct me if I'm wrong, that um, myself and another officer at that time on that course were the first to complete the whole course, whereas I know you're shaking head, Kevin. I'm not sure if, if we did the whole course or before that, or they just did the selection week. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I served in the battery as troop commander and battery captain until 97, um, when I went to Army Junior Division for staff training, and then I returned to the regiment in 98 to serve as the adjutant until 2000. So I finally left the regiment after five years and went to Germany with HQ 1st uh, Armoured Division as their SO2 target. And I left there to go to India for a year from May 2002 until May 2003. I picked up the post of battery commander while I was out there and I returned three weeks before the battery was due to deploy on Telic 2. So John, are you from a military family? No, uh, strangely enough, not at all. Uh, my, I come from a, a family of bakers, I'm the first of my family line, so uh, I don't really know what motivated me to join, but it, it certainly wasn't uh, a sense of family duty. Now, General Stone, when he's on his podcast, he did a stint as a baker before he joined the army. So you're you're you've got a good lineage there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. So, Kev, do you want to cover off a little bit about the Gulf War then before we sort of move on to the main part of the pod? Yeah, in 2003, um, Optelic or Gulf War Two, depending on how you remember it, which which as you mentioned has been overshadowed by the, the Afghan campaign, and uh, was one of the largest deployments of British forces since World War Two. And obviously there was loads of forces in the Middle East already because we had um, the RF were out there because they were doing the Operation North, Northern and Southern Overwatch. And that was a legacy from Gulf War One. It must have increased. It, it was larger or in the same size as Op Granby as a British contingent and as a coalition. It was far greater than Op Corporate or the Falklands campaign. And it was on par with the Suez deployment as well. And... <laughs> Huge, a huge build-up, a huge deployment onto Optelic 1, and then it, that led into a subsequent operation. So 
Teddy Desert was in operation lasted from 2003 to 2011, so it, was, so it wasn't an unsubstantial amount of time. And during that period, a total of 179 um, British Armed Forces um, died during the campaign. And if, and if you remember the news, there was thousands of Americans killed out there as well as part of the coalition. It was, it was massive. And there was a report came out in March 2007 that over 2,000 British soldiers or service personnel had returned from Iraq suffering from some form of mental illness, including PTSD. So, um, yeah, a massive campaign. We, we, we do forget that. So, John, can you outline the deployment of the battery on Telic, its involvement in the ground campaign, and also what it meant for the future of the unit and its continued struggle for survival and relevance during the various strategic defence reviews? Um, yeah, so, um, as I said in my intro, I I returned to the regiment just before the battery was due to deploy on Telic 2, uh, literally three weeks before. And as usual, my immediate impression was that Nothing uh, nothing had changed. I, I recall popping into the commanding officer's office on my first day back as a, just a matter of uh, courtesy. I'd literally flown in from India and I just wanted to pay my respects. And it, it became immediately clear that any chance I had of, of taking some leave was, was gone if I was going to have any involvement on that on the final prep of the battery ply to its deployment. The start of my assignment as battery commander wasn't really a happy one, uh, if I'm honest, and I, I uh, certainly not how officers would envisage those first days when they take over command of a unit that they really wanted to command. I recall being shown a letter by the commanding officer which basically said that the uh, days of the battery were numbered uh, in its current role uh, and that the preference was to convert it to a weapon locating battery which is obviously where the, the strategic priority was at that time. And I, and I know previous threads in earlier podcasts show that this was this was nothing new, but the tone and the seniority of the author suggested that this time, you know, our backs really were up against the wall uh, and there was a high likelihood that we were going to be disbanded effectively and reconverted into, uh, regenerated into something new. Simultaneously, I, I made the unpopular decision of reducing the pre-tour leave uh, for the for the lads from two weeks to one. Uh, you recall that, uh, Kev, that was a pretty tough decision to make. Um, and I did that so that I could see the unit before I took it uh, on tour. Um, and then to compound matters, I remember in one of those early days, I visited the headquarters of 19, uh, 19 Brigade, who were the brigade that we were deploying with for a pre-tele brief. And literally, no sooner had I walked into the HQ, but I was effectively ambushed by the chief of staff who informed me that the battery was going to effectively be stripped and split into its component parts. Uh, and the intention was to take the patrols forming uh, to form the recce troop for 40 field regiment royal artillery and the other elements uh, of the battery to reinforce the headquarters. And in those days, the roles... Uh, of that, uh, of the other elements to go into the headquarters were, were not clear. It was just you're going to go and and fill jobs. So, John, why did why did a field artillery regiment require a recce troop? Um, because it wasn't employed in the the field artillery role. It was employed as an infantry ground ground holding uh, battalion uh, role, um, uh, w common as you recall in days in Northern Ireland, um, and and. But in those days, that never caused any politics, whereas in Iraq, it, 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 it certainly did. It caused a bit of politics in, its, in itself. The, uh, I think um, it was clear that that ambush by the chief of staff when I walked into the headquarters was, uh, was pre-planned. Um, it, the decision had already been made. Uh, the, the structure of the force lay down for the brigade had already been decided, and and we were helpless to prevent it. Uh, I don't recall five regiment offering any counter argument or or coming into our defence to keep us a, as an integral unit. Um, and and I, I don't I don't really believe that the superior headquarters, one arts brigade, had done anything to support us either. However, you know, I always look at those opportunities as moment um, as as moments to to exploit um, for our own good and this proved to be no exception I mean Kev you'll recall our tour in uh, the Balkans in in the 90s was the same we we you know we went for one reason and we did we did a lot of other work and we added value uh, and so I applied the same 
the same mentality to to this to be honest however we didn't know it at the time so it was it was hard to stomach uh, and you can't help being winded uh, when you first deploy because you know you're not going in the capacity that you thought you were um, and because no one knew really how Telic was going to involve, uh, evolve, those those early days were really quite heady and and quite crazy because nothing panned out the way it was. Um, you know, we anticipated it was going to. It's interesting that five reg, of which four seven three is part of, offered no defence of the battery when, when we were looking at these rerolls for Telic, which is the current theme I think we've, we've as we've discussed throughout its history. Um. I think the, the regiment, five reg, and the gunners perhaps never fully understood what we are, what we could offer at the time and what we do offer today. Likewise, I think one Art brigade, which owned the regiment, um, struggled as well. I think they were more equipment orientated than maybe they were patrol or STA. And um, if you compare this to one for eight, which is fully supported by three commando and two nine regiments, um, who know how to exploit its capabilities, they they really do look after them. Better than yeah. perhaps um, our regiments have looked after four seven three. Yes, yeah, so um, I suppose once we were deployed in, into our various components, uh, me and my TAC established um, a deep brigade deep cell, which in modern language would be more aligned to a, a soft effect. Uh, cell, as there was no lethal or kinetic targeting taking place, certainly at the brigade level. Um, my uh, and my patrols had vanished down to Basra with uh, 40 Regiment. Uh, Joe, I'm sorry to interrupt you, mate. Yeah. Can you just cover for Lester's main and all us what you mean by soft effects? So, um, I, when we talk about effects, we talk about trying to achieve something. So, you know, delivering uh, explosive ordnance is an effect to um, to achieve a greater objective, which is either to destroy an enemy or, uh, you know, or close something down. Soft effects are, are non-lethal. So we would go out and you would identify um, uh, something that we would want to achieve. And the best way to deliver the effect, I, if you wanted to gain the support of the local populace, um, you would do it in a positive way. And I can give you an example. Um, we used to transit past Basra University quite quite a lot and we discovered that um, British military had decided to remove the generator from the university giving it no power um, and so our, our job was to change that and trying to restore power by giving them a, a, a generator can't remember if it was succeeding or not and the effects of that would have been positive uh, because it was next to Gama Alley which uh, as you know from the top end of Basra was quite a hotbed of insurgency um, and so that's soft effects Thanks John, cheers um, The um, so I, we created that cell and my other troop commanders embedded themselves into other areas. Uh, one of those was CIMIC, uh, which is civil military sort of cooperation. And again, you'll know, okay, we did that in the 90s when we were in the Balkans and it, yeah. it allowed yeah. us to get to places that normal ordinary troops couldn't do because you had a legitimate reason to to get into the weeds of, of towns and, uh, and areas. And again, it made for really good in gathering opportunities for uh, yeah. uh, for our unit. Now, forgive me, I'm going to focus on the work of me and my TAC over this time, as I think it was the result of what we did that actually enabled us to exploit an opportunity that I believe created the future for the battery. And all you have to do is look at the, the history of the battery from 2003 onwards and the great effects that the troops and the patrols did at the front end. And I think it was this moment that allowed it in many ways. Now, my team had carte blanche back in 2003 to do really what we wanted and we spent the majority of our time doing what the, the battery does best um, and we effectively went deep and while the brigade and UK as a whole were focused purely on Basra City and looking inwards into the town with the priority of creating the, the new police force and, and, and the security infrastructure we spent a lot of time uh, on the border uh, and we observed a total empty canvas uh, along the entire length uh, of that border. Uh, the battalions whose areas uh, area of operations covered these these border areas paid occasional trips out there. And in fact, we went on a few occasions with some of their recce platoons. Uh, but they were, and it's no criticism, they were overstretched, and so were routinely pulled in to support operations in the city. Um, 
as I say, we discovered a total porous border with real many signs of, of rat lines that were running from Iran into into Iraq, um, whether that was through the Shalamcha border crossing point itself and all the way up, up to and through uh, Maysan. Um, it was quite astounding, really, that the border infrastructure had completely been removed. I mean, everything from buildings through to cabling, vehicles, uh, communication infrastructure, you name it, it had all gone. And I recall asking the CIVSEC, so the civil secretary, the man who controlled the purse strings for multinational division southeast, what funds uh, could help could be made available to help us re-establish some of some form of Iraqi presence uh, at those key points where we had identified some rat lines, uh, and that was early on. If, <laughs> it made me giggle actually because I remember the CIVSEC just saying basically it could give us twenty thousand pounds <laughs> is what they offered, and it just showed not only the priority of what the UK placed on anything outside the centre of Basra, but it probably showed their lack of understanding of what the border was. I mean, twenty thousand pounds was the equivalent of a Hilux truck, and we were talking hundreds of kilometres of of hostile terrain. Um, and it, it just shows you the short-sightedness as because it was those rat lines that were established straight away in 2003 that fed the supply of ammunition uh, and specialist skills uh, into the insurgency that crippled us years later. And, and there were two main events uh, that I think, two specific events that changed the battery's future direction du during the tour after that. Just before you go on to that, John, it's interesting that two points that you bring up is this lack of strategic thought, which I think is a hallmark of Iraq for both the Americans and the Brits. They had no, they got there, they kicked Saddam Hussein out, and then they had no clue what they wanted to do. You know, they disbanded the army with no thought of what that meant, and they had no strategic direction. And you also mentioned Maysan province, which very later on in the campaign, developed into a violent hotspot for the insurgency. Uh, and most soldiers are well aware of Alamara, which is the administrative capital region. It's in that area that Johnson Bahari won his VC and Brian Wood also won his MC during the Battle of Danny Boy. Yes, and we can add one more. If you remember the uh, Battle of Majar al-Khabir, which was in on the 24th of June 2003, when the RMP-6 were were brutally killed uh, and I mean um, I remember literally we were in the ops room that morning literally just signing out to go on patrol up you know up to nearer that area uh, when that happened uh, and it's quite um, quite strange I live on an estate which has a memorial to Ben Hyde one of the RMPs because uh, he worked before he joined the army he worked at a B&Q depot which now no longer exists uh, and the entrance on the estate is called Ben Hyde Way in, in memory of him so yeah there's quite a sort of a uh, poignant link there for me in particular I suppose so going back to that the two occasions the first one of those was the encroachment of Iranian border forces into territory that had effectively previously been Iraq and if you remember that part of the border had been hotly contested between those two sides during the Iran-Iraq war I mean the, the the terrain was still bitterly marked with the uh, you know the scars of that, that those eight years of, of fighting and um, the um, um, this was effectively what we'd seen was along that imposed line of the drained marshlands east of Majnoon Island um, we were we were patrolling that area uh, one day um, and we came and you can see on the map where it, it, it there's a literally a, a 90 degree angle in the map and it's a it's an artificial line that had been formed after the Iran-Iraq war well, we were patrolling that area and came across Iranian forces who had made, who had clearly made the most of that lack of any Iraqi or coalition presence and had effectively up sticks and moved six kilometres into Iraq from their established border positions. And these border positions were identifiable by the, the border towers. Um, and they had established quite a good defensive position. Uh, on a on a ridge line, and it was clear that that position was temporary. But they had definitely, you know, section and cruiser weapons in place, uh, and were clearly continuing to to fortify them. And we visited a number of times, uh, and we to you know to gather more intelligence. But the headquarters and the brigade were pretty interested when we went back and, and and briefed them of what we'd seen, which was astounding when you think about it. We were we were liable, we were legally responsible for this. Territory, and we had given it away to uh, to Iran. 
and the, the more worrying thing was we weren't bothered now we revisited that place a number of times um and uh, an opportune conversation with other elements within our base from the US who were more intelligence based um, suddenly changed all that uh, and before long that issue became centre stage and really political. Now, I was dragged into the headquarters at MND Southeast and was having to brief the chief of staff in person. Uh, and I remember suddenly the, uh, how in, I remember it was quite funny, uh, because we suddenly realised it had gone from no interest to strategic interest. Um, I was briefing in the headquarters to the chief of staff and I had uh, the team back out relaising the targets just to make sure that what we were saying was absolutely the truth because suddenly realised. And so they were out literally relaising them. Uh, and I was getting the SMSs to say, yeah, you, you're good to go. The information you're about to brief is correct. So that was quite funny. The, uh, the process resulted in, actually, after a long time, and I remember there was one patrol where we actually took one of our American colleagues with us to show him because he didn't believe us. And it resulted in the diplomatic effort persuading the Iranians to, to pull back. Uh, and its forces went back to its established line. It is worth noting, um, if you think what you said, Colin, about that strategic plan of where you wanted to go. Yeah. That Ten years later, I went back to Iraq as a, as a civilian briefly with a, a security company uh, and that piece of land that Iran had moved into is now one of the single largest oil deposits in the region, uh, the Majnoon oil fields and that provides the majority of the nation's wealth and if you think about had we not done what we'd done the wealth and the entire strategic mission of putting Iraq back on its feet and being financially independent wouldn't have been possible because the money would have been drawn into Iran rather than Iraq and do you reckon that was a deliberate attempt the Iranians they knew the value of that land and they were trying to sort of encroach on it in order to seize that for themselves yes I do in hindsight we didn't know that at the time but when I went back uh, in, in 2012 uh, as a civilian and looked at the area it was like well how convenient because uh, Iran could have moved in in any part of that border but it chose to move in that particular part uh, and if, if anyone who works in the oil and gas industry in that part of the world or the security industry they'll know the most new oil fields uh, and it, you know that's exactly where it was um, so yeah I don't believe it was a coincidence and um, so what that did, it exposed the fault in the UK's military structure and, and its composition in theatre. And I remember having numerous conversations with the chief of staff and, and expressed those concerns and to the brigade commander um, in that they had no formation level eyes or ears to look beyond that close battle uh, in Basra whenever anything went, went wrong. And things were always going wrong. You know, we had the... There were lots of strikes and demonstrations and blockades of the oil transiting through, and we were we were getting excited with the troops of, of the Iraqis bringing oil down the Shatel Arab waterway. And if there was an incident at a petrol station because there was a shortage of fuel, the troops were going into lockdown, into static posts, and and the brigade went blind every single time. And and so that was that was the point. Yeah, I think. Looking at the, the tele campaign, and obviously when you when you look in the past and you look you review it, tele was the war fighting phase. Everything else is going to be a quick stabilisation, quick rebuild, and quickly out. We were never going to be there for a long time. And I imagine that the mindset was it was a plaster fix, get out, leave a leave a, a government that's good enough in place, and move away. And it never happened. But I think the, the other trend that we're starting to see the, the, the army at the time is that special rec reconnaissance capabilities didn't seem to exist or be phased out or forgotten about and had to be reinvented skills that we already had but we'd lost we saw this in Bosnia um, and that led to the formation of the DRU which Colin was involved in That's, why do you think that the British Army who has these skills allowed them to lapse and then move you know identified that they needed it again I think uh, that's a really good question, and I think it's uh, I think it's twofold, really, or primarily twofold. One, I think, is that um, we we like to pride ourselves in in the British military that we learn uh, and that we evolve our learning and, and we keep up with you know the lessons that we pick up from previous occupations, uh, previous tours, and the like. And I just think it's a lack of understanding as to what 
those specialist recon capabilities can offer. Uh, and we forget it in peacetime because, um, you know, what value does it provide on, on, on an exercise or on day-to-day -day routine of military? And again, so we learn it every time on every operation we go on to because that value is suddenly is magnified. And then I think there is increasingly uh, a view, and I think it was there to see on Telic, uh, that technology trumps all. Uh, and that we forget the qualitative nature uh, and the value that the human eye has over the digital lens. Um, and, you know, the, the push for digitization is um, and and a technical solution because it also removes the soldier from the field and reduces the likelihood of, of, of fatalities and having to bring your injured and your dead home. Yeah, that's a great point. As always, every now, every operation you deploy on, is that how will it affect the public back home when they see hearses going through wooden basset or soldiers at Headley Court minus legs and arms? So, yeah, I think that's an absolutely great point, John. Yeah, I think the, the second event, uh, and I think this was the trigger, if I'm honest, um, this was caused by the death of British personnel in Basra. And and they weren't the first, because we already remember that in June, you know, we'd lost, so post the war fighting, you know, we'd lost the, RM, the six from the RMP in June. Um, and this was August, if I remember rightly. Um, our... As with our ability to move freely, we, we travelled through Basra extensively as a, as a small team and we observed how the UK and coalition forces were just setting patterns, travelling through the same roads at the same time. There was no discipline, there was no change, there was no disrupting the routine to confuse the enemy. And without being directed to do so, my team and I undertook a, a series of threat assessments at the key sites around the city with the aim of convincing the bra brigade to impose route restrictions and and putting force protection measures that would ultimately protect us but it ran counter to the the collective view at the time that that basra was safe now these areas of concerns all had spot names as the, the military map area had been overlaid with uh, colors spot spot colors and numbers and that made it easier to refer to locations we'd undertaken a number of these and we were submitting reports uh, to the brigade on a case-by-case -case basis again no one was telling us to do it we were doing it when we had time uh, and our recommendation our continued recommendation to the brigade was to create a brigade surveillance and, and recce capability uh, but at that time, we were just getting no traction at all until the day a number of uh, UK personnel were unfortunately killed in, a, in an incident, which was at or very close to one of those areas that we had undertaken one of these uh, threat assessments. Now, if I'm honest, it really is harder than I thought uh, to speak about this because one of the individuals, I think there were three that were killed, uh, he was a friend of mine. And, and even to this day, I can't help but think that if we'd done things differently or if we'd carried out that threat assessment earlier or been directed to or we'd convinced the brigade and the headquarters to change those routes earlier so put in better force protection measures to to close routes down on a, on a day-to-day -day basis to, to confuse the enemy then maybe those men and, and my friend would still be alive today so it's a bit ironic really because you look back to that campaign and there's a lot of the British Army at the time saying that this is our speciality because we've spent, you know, 30 years in Northern Ireland. But a lot of what you mentioned there, John, was routine operations and force protection in Northern Ireland. So it's amazing that on the one hand, we're trumping how great we were in Northern Ireland. And then at the operational level, we completely forgot all those operational force protection matters that kept people alive. Mm. And, you know, it's always controversial, but no way when we can talk about this a wee bit later on. But I, again, Iraq was the first time that we suffered a defeat. I and mean, politicians can trump it up any way we like, but I, I personally think we were defeated on the ground there. Politicians won't admit it, generals won't admit it, but we left with our tail between our legs. Well, I, I think you're 100% right. Um, we, we did, you know, we stated our rep... We, we claimed our reputation on, on our time in Northern Ireland uh, and we ignored it. Immediately, we went to Iraq at great cost. I mean, I actually did four tours in uh, Iraq. I went back in 2006 when we really were having it handed to us. Um, and I went back again in 2008 after Charge of the Knights uh, and I, uh, we pulled back in 2006 and 2007 in, into the into the Cobb and the Fobs, and then in 2008 I went back and I was mentoring um, 
uh, an Iraqi joint headquarters in the Shatel Arab Hotel, where previous you know military units had once occupied. And then I went back again uh, to Baghdad this time in 2011. Was one of the last UK personnel to leave. We left on something like the 22nd of December. Uh, by that time, we were part of the NATO training mission, training the Sanders in the Sands and the Officer Academy. So I saw the whole the whole span right from the start, right till the end. And I, I agree with you, we were defeated. Um, so, yeah. So what happened when you finally got the ear of the brigade, if you like? How did you then move on from that point? Well, um, it, you're right. That's, and that's the term I would use. We did. We, we had the ear of the brigade uh, and our ideas suddenly got traction. And I remember getting pulled into uh, the office with the chief of staff that morning. And it really didn't take long for the patrols to be pulled from their role as recce troop for 40 Regiment to create what... Uh, the precursor to what effectively became the BRF, the Brigade uh, Recon Force. Uh, the CO40 Regiment, as you can imagine, uh, opposed uh, the move uh, as he knew the quality of the assets he had with our troops uh, that he had at his disposal. Um, but it was clear that our argument was overwhelming. We did have a sort of a gentlemanly con conversation, and we, I remember saying to, to him that, you know, nothing personal, but I want them back. And I remember him saying, nothing personal, but I want to keep them. <laughs> um, and he lost. Now, he's a three-star general, so, <laughs> <laughs> so and I'm not. Um, and as, but as soon as we as soon as we got the go, uh, I sent some of the personnel back to the UK to undertake photography courses, and worked with the SO3 G4, the brigade, who was a real ally. And again, it was one of those things where, as a battery and individuals in the battery, you identify the best way to deliver effects. And one of those ways was to find allies. And I honestly think that this captain, he he made it for us because he just cut through the red tape and he got us all the kit that we needed included high spec cameras and l96 rifles uh, and and other kits and he did it uh, he bypassed so much and it just happened quickly and so you can imagine with all of a sudden pulling together the capability the equipment coming in uh, troops going back to uk to do training it didn't take long before this became quite a political uh, topic and so we immediately started to get visits including from UK-based chain of command I remember the one Art Brigade commander came to visit us as well as uh, organisations such as the now defunct COTAT uh, what was it Covert Observational Training Advisory Team um, now I always remember they came in and tried to argue that they were the subject matter expert in this in this role, uh, even though to be honest they had no theatre experience. They were very Northern Ireland orientated, and regardless of this, um, this was the moment the battery needed, and we we exploited it to the full. If I'm honest, uh, we retained the capability throughout the remainder of Tele Two through Telic 3 and then handed over to our reserve colleagues in the Honourable Artillery Company for Telic 4. So I think we cemented that capability and, and made it our own. Um, and that by cementing ourselves in that surveillance and reconnaissance role, it gave us the launch pad for, for the years to come through the whole of Telic uh, and, and into Herrick. Um, However, I don't. It, it wasn't that simple, if I'm honest. On on returning to the UK at the end of Tele Two, um, old battles were still there, and the new ones appeared. I must admit, I did feel that the demise of the battery, which was so apparent in that letter from six months earlier, was no longer being viewed with the same urgency that it that it once had. But that pressure was, I believe, still there, as some of the old entrenched opinions about the battery continued to exist throughout the regiment and throughout the Royal Regiment as as well as the wider army. I, I think we talk about this and other, other ones. I think that, that continued through. What I did find, though, is um, other arms appreciated the skill set the battery had more than the gunners. Yes. They, they understood it more. Yeah. And so they would employ you and use you better. Yeah. I think once, gunners, yeah. Yeah. I think what you had to do though is an overcome that scepticism yeah. from an infantry unit. And, and, and quite yeah. rightly, they're looking at gunners and thinking, what the hell are these guys, yeah. what can they bring? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, did, I do think that was a trend, but I did find that everyone I worked with was non-gunner, sort of got it before the gunners. The gunners, technical and let's call it traditional gunner skills, mm. found new skills sometimes a bit challenging for them to take in but I think yeah. our patrol as a patrol battery 
we were not technical. We just didn't fit the gun and mould and probably still don't in the true sense. I think the, the Royal Artillery, by its nature, is a very conventional organisation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, which, which is strange, seeing as in the First World War, they were the ones flying the airplanes and doing spotting and observing and yeah. using all the imaginative ways of technical to get the, you know, the guns to fire more accurately. And then we've moved backwards into a safe zone, perhaps. Yeah. So what were, so John, what were the main lessons learned then during this period and how did you apply them to him? Improving the batch's training and skills. Um, it, it was clear, there was no there was no time to rest, Kev. To be honest, when we got back, so and it was clear straight away that um, f- uh, as soon as we got back, the um, we started looking throughout the entire spectrum of what we did, and it was clear that the battery structure, its operational purpose, its equipment holdings, and career paths were had simply been neglected uh, by the regiment uh, and indeed the Royal Regiment for many years. And I suppose if you looked at us at face value, at what our base equipment was, uh, we we were obsolete. Um, but I suppose I and anyone else who had an eye to the current and future needs of what we wanted, certainly going through Iraq and Afghanistan, we were anything but, and, and Telic 2, 3 and 4 certainly proved that. Within days of returning from post-tour leave, and I found this just astounding, we were, we were told to support a brigade with whom we had no relationship um, uh, and we were being asked to provide fire support teams uh, for a Testex, a Tezex. Um, and it was, in, in my eyes, I suppose, a deliberate ploy. At that time, it was, in my eyes, a deliberate ploy to divert what had been immensely positive feedback from um, a very successful tour on our part um, and to put us back into the old ground. And, and I, I accept that, in hindsight, I may have been a little paranoid, but... but it was different. The environment was different back in 2004. Certainly the heated discussion I had had with the 2IC and the CO at that time suggested otherwise. My priority was to capitalise on, on the lessons of Telic and to restructure the battery in order to meet the future demands that had become clear during Telic 2. We had to be lighter, we had to be more agile and we had to provide the human surveillance, again going back to that qualitative uh, value um, and that recce capability that we knew that was missing in in the UK military sort of uh, structures. And um, I had to start by changing the career structure. I mean, I I couldn't believe it. We were in a position that I simply could not legitimately promote bombardiers to sergeant. And I recall having a conversation with the regimental career Managing uh, management officer telling who was telling me to look the other way as it was simply too difficult as we had no qualified uh, course attributed to to us at that level that would allow us to promote a bombardier into a sergeant in the trade or special observer that the course that we'd relied on was was one deep uh, and it no longer existed. Was that the old? Army Combat Survival Instructor at Hereford, John. It was a throwback to the Stay Behind rule. Yep, that, that's that's the one. And, and it had gone. It, it wasn't there anymore. And so, um, if you looked at the crewman, was it crewman two thousand? The, the, yeah. Or whatever it was. The yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the career structure. Um, you know, it was a ACSI was the course to promote from bombardier to sergeant, and and it didn't exist. So we couldn't put anyone on it. And so we were we were looking around for other courses, but. The special observer trade didn't recognise any others. So, uh, and you can see in that 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 career structure name Crewman mm. two thousand. It seems it highlights why we we wouldn't fit into it because we were more an, uh, a dismounted infantry style unit. Hundred percent. And Crewman is all about running around in vehicles and doing doing courses that were really not suited to what we did. Absolutely. Yeah, te- technical artillery. Yeah, yeah technical absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And what was the solution then, John? It was it was simple for me because, well, it was a quick fix solution. It really was. And it was a simple one for me at the time. Um, and that was for me to align the special observer trade to the OP ACK trade. Uh, and I know it was it was contentious at the time, um, but that would at least give us the formal ability to, to queue fires because everything that we'd done up to now effectively with qualified OP ACKs was on good grace because it wasn't linked into our career path. Um, 
Uh, and so, you know, that had been taken for granted. Uh, and again, when it went back to the CEO who said, I want you to go and provide uh, JTACs, uh, wrong, um, you know, FSTs for, for this Tezex, it was like, oh, on what on what basis? You know, we've just been on a tour for six months in a surveillance and reconnaissance role. I'm not formally required to, to staff FSTs. Um, yet you're asking me to put out FSTs in support of a brigade on a Tezex that we've had no familiarization or training with. Um, and so at least if we'd had that within the former career path, it would have made it easier. Were you um, concerned about loss of reputation for going on that Tezex and maybe not performing as well because you hadn't been, been yeah. trained properly? Is that your main concern? Yes, it was. It was It was the main concern. And I have to admit, because of the frame of mind I was in, I felt it was it was deliberate. And I thought it was a, it was deliberate in order to undermine the success because the, the success, the bow wave of compliments and, and good reports that we were getting and the commanding officer, we had an ally in him. He was singing our praises and, you know, we know where he, he, he went through his career. And the feedback was really positive. And my, my attitude was, why would you do this at this time? Why would you not want us to, to cement that those values and that those lessons and to, to take us forward? Why do you want to take us back to the old battles that we've been having? And I know the battery had had in 2000, and two um so yeah i it'd been a bit of a stand-up stand-up fight with the regimental hierarchy actually to not go on that and um so i i, I went further than linking it to the opiac trade so that was the career path for the 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 trade of special observer but i went further to qualify more of the battery into jtac and sniper qualifications because i wanted to provide that ability for our patrols to provide that sensor to shoot a link uh, you know to make us a complete integral capability um, but the restructure itself was was more complex but one thing i did know straight away was that what needed to be done was that we had to make the battery lighter at the rear in terms of its command and control and its logistic support slice that backed up the patrols because for mine, it didn't matter if you, based on the traditional concept of operations, it didn't matter whether it was one patrol or 12 patrols that went, you had this huge command and control and logistics slice that would follow. And we had to become more modular because I think that was one of the reasons why the battery didn't go on Telic 2. The bang for your buck that you gave from what you were going to send at the front end was not matched by, was out, outweighed by, you know, the, the mass of logistics support that you sent and, and spaces were tight. And so we had to become more modular. Um, and uh, so once we, you know, that, that needed a complete overhaul. And I'll be the first to say, I, I might have started that journey, but in no way finished it. And I think it was years until greater certainty was given in terms of, you know, the uh, the the place that the battery has on on the military orb and it was the bcs that followed me that really picked up that mantle and 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 continued um i think in part this for me this uh, this struggle has always been due to the fact that our battery has been and you've raised it earlier on colin we've been an anomaly to the royal artillery uh, and they have in my opinion never really truly appreciated the capability that they had and still have in that battery and its soldiers and and they were happy to use them uh, as we've seen in in northern ireland as we've seen in the balkans and we've seen in iraq and afghanistan but that conceptual that intellectual and that financial investment has always been lacking um and i did <laughs> i found it strange in 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 2004 um was spent focus i was spent focusing on this while at the same time i was i was having to address what what had always been an issue for the lads uh, which was the color of the berry um and i i appreciate i did not give that issue the attention that the lads certainly felt it deserved but for me it really wasn't the priority at the time although i, I accept many didn't see it I, I probably could have communicated it better and 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 showed them that there was a, a sequence of priorities that we had to do in order to cement the, the future of the battery. And that for me, that the very, although important, and now that the lads have that, I think it helps separate us from the badge more and it identifies us for what we are. But at, just at that time in 2004, it seemed to be such an important issue for the for the lads. But, it, you know, if, if it was kind of like, if you knew what I knew, you know, we, we would put it in, in a priority order. And as I say, I probably, in hindsight, I probably could have communicated that a lot better. I think, I think it's hard. I think it's hard to communicate any of these because 
if you start telling everyone about all the issues, mm. morale will drop down anyway because you feel like, well, well I'm not going to be in six months' time. I don't know why I'm, you know, my, yeah. my, this unit could did, could disband. And you can't share that, unfortunately. And, no. You know, that's, that, as I say. I've always thought... Tough for the top. Yeah, tough for the top, John. Tough and, the top. and Chris Lincoln-Jones brought this up in his podcast. Yeah. He said, the more, I think the phrase he used is something like, the more... Uh, the best, better trained and better motivated your troops, the harder they are to manage and lead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I've, got, I've always said, I've always said something similar. I, I've always said it's just, just when I was the BC, just give me the opportunity to put my soldiers in the field, and you will, they speak for themselves, and then yeah. bring them back into barracks. <laughs> it's just, well, it's right just st- stand by <laughs> for the BSM to uh, in barracks. Yeah, it's an absolute nightmare, but a, an absolute delight. And I think, um, yeah, I, I'll always something you just said, Kev. I remember when you and I were communicating when I was in India, and you were, you know, I was telling I'd been picked up on the BC, and you were you were drip feeding me some information, and then I ca- I came back on day one, and we had a chat, and then you laid it all bare. Uh, and I was like, well, why didn't you, why didn't you tell me this before I came? And you went, well, you never would have come. You know, I started off as a gunner in the battery, and when, as you go up, you get to know more. Mm. The more you know, the less you can tell, tell because yeah. you can't tell the blokes why you've got to do something. You just got to do it because there's so much pressure from the main office and further, and you know you end up having that conversation when you have to drift over to see the adjunct or the TIC yeah. for that conversation where I didn't get invited in for coffee or something just to be told off again for someone <laughs> else's mistake. I, I spent many an hour in Port Masters and yeah. offices to, to take a bollock in for somebody else's choice. Yeah. Hey, mate. That's, that's life. As you just said to join. Tough at the top. I know, tough at the top. Absolutely. Tough at the top. Join but the front. Th- I was just going to say, talk to Danny Cado last on the last part, and we talked about all this groundwork. I mean, the, the courses that the battery do now, very well established. They're, they're doing the same courses as the infantry, so all that credibility that we were always struggling with, perhaps in the past, mm. we haven't got that anymore. Because if you can complete junior and senior Brecon, yeah, then you're as good as the infantry. Yeah. If you're doing the light recce course, you're as good as anyone else in in, in the armed forces. So there's no more. Oh, you're only a gunner. Well, actually, I'm a gunner with all these infantry qualifications and yeah. this, and I'm also a specialist. Yeah. So actually, I think it's taken a long time to evolve to that point, but perhaps we've now reached that point where the all arms look at these courses as their premier courses. Yes. And four seven three are on them. Yeah. It's just trying to get the gunners to accept that we've got now gunners on the premier infantry and armoured reconnaissance courses. Yeah. And so we've got some really quality soldiers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose the only thing for me to say after that is my, my time in command at the battery was cut short, really, by six months as the, the two I see at the time left at a uh, very short notice. He resigned his commission and I suppose as the senior BC there because others have come in behind me in other batteries. I ended up uh, having to step in to fill the gap. So that was it. I, I moved on yeah, shortly after that. So, so in, in a short paragraph... What's the future for the SA patrols as you see it today? Uh, I suppose, I suppose for me, yeah, suppose for me it is to, in my current world where I work, it, we work on the principles of integrated emergency management and the first step is anticipation. So in my current job, the first phase of what I do is anticipate. And I think the same principle applies for the battery. We, sh- we If we think deep, we have to conceptually think deep. So that the future for the battery is to stay ahead of the game. Uh, and yeah, by staying yeah. ahead of the game, we we increase our chances of survival into the, the you know the modern future army, however that looks. That's yeah. a great point. I think yeah, we didn't yeah. do that before up to that period in the early two thousands. I yeah. think we just sat back on our laurels a little bit, yeah, maybe, agree. and and didn't anticipate. And you, you, and you fought the wars you've been in, not the ones that you couldn't see, because there was no uh, say support or money for you to say, well, actually, I'd like to develop this route, mm. this equipment for this potential. Yeah. Because other people were, if you can't bring everyone on board, then no one's going to invest in it. No, I agree. <clears throat> so then we meet, we meet the more interesting, we get, we get the more interesting part as well. Now <laughs> we do Desert Island Dits, which is always my favourite part. Um, so John, 
Your favourite book, film, and luxury item. Right. So uh, you made me think long and hard about this, actually. So my my favourite military book has always been always been Stalingrad by Anthony Beaver, and I suppose it it is when, when you read that book, you just see the enormity of of you know warfare and the aspect of World War Two in particular, and the sheer size of the operations. Uh, and I, I mentioned it earlier on. I undertook four tours of Iraq, uh, and I recall in particular my tour in 2006 when I was an acting lieutenant colonel um, and I was SO1 plans in the headquarters and I was heavily involved in the planning of Operation uh, Sindabad. Um, and and you, again, you can Google that. And its predecessor to that was Operation Salamanca. Um, probably bad name, didn't really go down well with the Iraqis. Um, I <laughs> wasn't my name. I recall trying to, I, I can't, I'll never forget, I was trying to create capacity within the multinational division in order to deliver an effect of, of Sindabad, which was to, uh, you know, spread security through the streets within a, a structured way of bringing in military capability to establish the security in order that you could fill it from the back with uh, other elements of development and reassurance and business um, and throughout that entire four structure when you cut it down to the bone we only had 11 spare multiples now for, for those that don't know a multiple is what 12 12 people so we had about 132 <laughs> spare soldiers that you could actually play with which which is one company effect basically just a company puss uh and so multinational division south was if you wanted to deliver an effect you had a company and here we were as a divisional headquarters planning operations when when you compared it and people in the headquarters tried to compare it with the u.s op together forward and op together forward too and i was traveling up to uh the u.s uh, headquarters at alfor palace every week for planning groups about what we were doing and you talked about earlier on Colin about the loss of reputation I assure you by 2006 the UK had lost the reputation of the Americans we were we were laughing stock and I remember going up to L4 Palace to brief what we were doing and they kind of just yeah it was like <laughs> thanks for so coming what? yeah and that was it <laughs> um, so, so for a professional officer that must have been quite hard for you to take John it was yeah, it was it was immense because I had to go up there every week. I got onto the C one thirty, flew up to Baghdad, briefed, uh, yeah, and it was. And then I remember oh, we we took that plan, and I with the commander and the chief of staff, we briefed. Um, yeah, I remember briefing the president Maliki uh, of what we were going to do. Uh, and how we were going to do it, and he uh, and I, I'd been speaking a lot at that time to the uh, headquarters of Ten Iraqi Army Division, uh, but was doing it on a personal basis. And um, I remember when Maliki looked across to the GOC of Ten Iraqi Army Division and said, "You know, how much of the UK, you know, d uh, collaborated with you on the planning?" And um, and the Iraqi general just went nothing you know we haven't done anything and so we ended up having to go back and completely rewrite it and it was a lot more you know giving in terms of money and development and the security with our company was was minor and i suppose when you look at what we were doing in iraq and you compare it to you know if you read uh, anthony beaver's book we're playing at it well, millions it be even northern ireland john mm. Twenty thousand soldiers in northern ireland at the height of the troubles yes you're right. absolutely yeah yeah. And, yeah. yeah and we had one brigade to cover one brigade to cover the entire uh basra i suppose my uh, my favorite war movie if i'm really honest it's not one of your grand ones it is the 1988 falklands movie tumble down that stars colin firth not many people probably uh, remember that movie actually but i suppose i was fortunate when i was at sanders to have um, my colour sergeant as a, he was a flank company, Scots Guards, um, and he was one of the ones that made it to the top uh, of Tumbledown. And so as an officer cadet going through Sanders, listening to his stories and his recollections of that war, which were the first of my conscious, first military conflict of my conscious memory, made it really real for me. So I enjoyed the movie when I, I watched it years later. 
because I could see it from another, I saw it from another angle, having listened to the stories of, of my colour sergeant. And I, I'll never forget, it's really strange, there was, there's one line in that movie that Colin Firth says, and, and he's, he's starting to open fire on the Argentinians for the first time, and he, he speaks to himself, and he, you know, he goes, targets fall when hit. And it, and it kind of indicates that how that training automates his actions um, as he sees the enemy fall when hit by a shot and, and you can see that's the whole purpose of training isn't it it's to automate your yeah, your process muscle memory yeah absolutely it? and it reminds me of an incident during Telic 2 and it was on one of those that I can't remember the day but we were driving north of Basra to go to the border um, and we ended up in it, it was an accidental we ended up in the crossfire that what seemed to turn out to be a, a dispute in Garma Ali and there were a number of uh, heated exchanges of uh, automatic fire and that you could tell that they were 50 cal and rounds were passing really quite close to us and it got to a point where it caused us to deploy into a defensive position into into the trough in the ground uh, so we could call in the contact because uh, we didn't know at that time that it wasn't aimed at us because uh, they were passing quite close and I remember having to use my that little you know the original Nokia one that what's yeah. his name that comedian used to make his uh, joke on uh, with the ringtone and I sent my contact report over that mobile phone because uh, the radios weren't working and I sent it as if it was by the radio and even though you didn't have to depress the press on the mobile phone I still said over at the end of sending the contact report <laughs> and I still I still laugh about that and I that makes me that, that reminds me because I remember travelling up and down between the, the coalition operating base at the airport up to Alamara mm. and there was hardly any comms coverage mm. and your last resort was that mobile phone yeah. and I believe you used to have to go through to an MOD operator yes. who, yeah, 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 yeah. who yeah. connects you to the ops room in, in Iraq. Uh, back yes. in Iraq who sounded as though she was a little old lady knitting <laughs> didn't she was it the same one because yeah, every time I spoke to that lady it was as if she was knitting quietly in a corner on a very old leather chair <laughs> it's, it's the, it's the abs- <laughs> that to me just sums up the absurdity yeah, of Iraq absolutely. hello Emily yes can you put me through to Alamara ops room please yeah absolutely yeah so yeah exactly it still makes me laugh and i suppose my my favorite luxury item and you're probably going to laugh at me uh because uh I, I am a massively different person to the the, the you know the guy i was back in the 90s and, and can get an old john yeah i know uh, i mean i'm, I'm 52 uh, i suppose now yeah i am 52 but my, my knees courtesy of 473 battery more like 85 uh, and they are i name my body i name myself according i age myself according to the parts of the body i'm referring to so i am 52 my knees are 85 my shoulders are about in the 60s my heart is probably still about 21 year old my brain head probably about 14 and um <laughs> so but I, i'm a father of four now and a husband to you know an amazing woman who sort of put me on the right track and my one luxury item would be a photo of my fam- family nothing more nothing less I fully support that, mate. I'm very lucky at yourself. So, if Kev's still young, free and single for any ladies listening. <laughs> if they want to write in, he's he's available for, I don't know, pole dancing, Kev? I've got the knees of a 21-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I think we'll leave it there before you start describing other body parts. <laughs> mate, so, Kev, I, just for the record, Kev, I remember you and me running that route in Bosnia in 96. And you and, you and me, uh, if... Yeah, we ran very similar. I would say, like, pregnant penguins with a banana squarely inserted. And these have been knackered since forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my recommendation this week is The Accidental Warrior, which is a book by a guy called Jeffrey Pico, who was an officer in the Hampshire Regiment, and uh, very similar to Sidney Jerry, who I talked about the other week. And he was also in the Somerset Light Infantry at the start uh, of his army career. So, a lot of books written about regiments in World War II focus on the more glamorous units such as the Parachute Regiment and the Commandos who actually and I'm going to get some hate mail in here who actually spent limited time in ops and also had large gaps between deployments there was also an argument in World War II that these units sucked in a lot of highly motivated soldiers who were deployed into action by some of the least experienced pilots and ops that delivered limited results so I'll stand by for a bit of hate mail saying that one However, the Hampshires was one of the county regiments that formed the backbone of the British Army in World War II and did a lot of heavy fighting around the world. And ironically, given my comments earlier, um, they also took part in the Arnhem Operation 
And something we discussed in the pod a few times is that uh, it took Afghanistan and Iraq, I think, to break the post Falklands view that only the Marines and Paras were capable of difficult operations under arduous conditions. And arguably, this allowed conventional line units to get involved in ops previously reserved for out-of-area specialists and maybe operating at lower levels of ops previously the domain of special forces. And I think, really, this is vindicated by the formation of the new Ranger battalions, and uh, you know, that's the way the Army's going. So the title from this book comes from the fact that he volunteered for the Pay Corps in 1940 and he was initially classified as unfit for frontline service. But later on in the war, the army changed its fitness requirements and he was graded A1 and this allowed him to apply for a commission, ironically, into the Royal Artillery. And during this process, he was informed that he's too slow, too sleepy, too weak and too soft for the field artillery and was posted to an anti-aircraft unit. Uh, and he enjoyed a cushy existence until a shortage of infantry led him to being transferred to the Hampshires, and he landed in Normandy in D plus two and became the OC of a mort platoon. And at the end of forty four he transferred to seven Hampshires as a rifle platoon commander and remained with them to the war's end. It's a really great account of a section soldier who was turned into an unlikely warrior. And as a gunner, his accounts of deploying the mort line in MSCs are a real interest. And I'll finish off with a quote from the last chapter that rang a bell for me and is equally applicable, I think, again to the role of STA patrols. And in that he said, The infantryman is a king of warriors. He lives closer to the enemy than anyone else and can be in almost continual crisis. He lacks the psychological comfort of a large gun, vehicle, ship or similar equipment and he can cling only to his pals and they to him. And the comradeship that rises is very special. It is the brotherhood of those who have mastered themselves and served their team. And I think that's a really great account of any sort of dismounted uh, soldier. So, Kev, what's your choice this week, mate? Yeah, my choice this time is a, a book called MI9, which is uh, from the Second World War. And it's one of the many MI sort of um, groupings that I, I didn't realise there were so many, because everyone knows about MI5, MI6. MI9 was a part of military intelligence, and it was a highly secret department in the war office, and he had two principal tasks. It was assisting in the escape of Allies POWs held by the, the Germans or Axis forces and helping Allied military personnel, especially downed airmen, to evade capture after they were shot down and get back to uh, back to the UK or back to friendly friendly soil. Um, and so I, I read it and I thought back to our days in the old stay behind days where we, we spent a lot of time preparation and training into escape and evasion, survival, um, making improvised kit. And we obviously we did prone to capture training. We did conduct after capture training. If we were captured, how to survive, how to escape. So it had, a, it had some linkages to that. And also some of the training that we did is some of the same training that was done during the uh, Second World War and by these sort of organisations who, who developed the, the rat runs through Europe, either into Spain or into other parts of um, uh, the, the non-occupied parts of France and escape back to the UK to, to fight again. Uh, and one of the, no the notable people in, in this organisation was a guy called Aaron Neve, who was um, part of the logistics side when it went... Um, he joined it. He was recruited into it. And he was recruited into it because he was the first British officer to escape Colditz, which I never knew about, uh, even, though, even though I've read some books about him when he worked at Nuremberg Trials. And so with all that skill, he come back. He was awarded the MC for his, for his escape from Colditz. It was his second attempt. And he became part of MI9. And in the development, originally just in Europe, in bringing back soldiers or airmen, um, Providing equipment into into camps as well, into POW camps, which I was amazed reading about. They had a magician who helped develop um, items that could be disguised and then sent across. Um, they sent everything via charities, but not the Red Cross, because obviously that would convene the Geneva Convention. What they didn't want was the Germans then to stop all Red Cross parcels. Um, they got toy companies in the UK to help develop hiding silk maps, hiding compasses and such like into board games. And they were sent across to uh, POWs as well. And this was further expanded then into the Far East and the Middle East as well, uh, different sections coming under the MI9 banner. And it's, it suggested that the one of the, the head quartermasters, uh, known as Q, was one of the runners for the 
um, obviously the fictional James Bond character when you go see Q and they get all the fancy little bits and pieces and some of that was taken from ideas that the MI9 provided so what they just provided was fantastic escape kits and um, escape chains as well so obviously they had uh, assistance throughout Europe from French resistance from French families so they had great risk themselves really good book I really enjoyed it I thought it was um it took me back a little bit to those days when we were we were doing the Cold War part on the Stay Behind piece, when we were hoping that somebody would put us up, feed us or whatever, as we were trying to catch up with armoured brigades moving back towards Calais and you were on your foot with your Bergen on your back. Not Walking through a desolate nuclear wasteland. <laughs> with the NBC suit and the radio that doesn't work. <laughs> oh, and interesting enough, Harry Neve was a gunner. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, but he, he joined... I can't remember the regiment he joined. Uh, I think he was in the reservists or the TA at the time as an en- Royal Engineer and then transferred over and got commissioned as a gunner. Um, killed by, is it? Inla. No, Inla. it was Inla. Inla. Uh, Irish yeah. National Liberation Army claimed responsibility uh, when they blew him up. But he was at the, like I say, he was at Newbury Trials as a staff officer there. He wrote a book about that. Really good book if you want to read that one. Um, awarded a DSO. MC, OBE, and a bronze star. And killed by Enla and a bloody yeah. under underneath the house of Commons. What That's it, yeah, yeah. So, um, we've come to the end. So thank you to John and to you, the listener, for your continued support and suggestions. Our email address is at the bottom of the show notes if you want to get in touch. Um, you'll find us on all the usual social media sorts of bits and pieces. As you know, I don't know nothing about that. Um, you can find us um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, iTunes. Please share, subscribe. Please give comments as well, um, which, which is really useful. And we do read all the comments. And Kev won't know this because he hates social media, but we've had nearly 50 reviews on iTunes and we've got uh, 4.9 out of five ratings so give us a few more then please everybody out there yeah somebody let us down though with their review obviously yeah uh, we're, we're still looking for them <laughs> <laughs> and a huge thanks again to Nick Beale for supporting the uh, the series and offering te- technical support through his company ISR so see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier